Have you ever been in a situation where you're different? I think pretty much everyone has. You know, being the only one who... I've been in so many situations where I was different that I could write a book about it. But I'll give you two. When I was a girl, um, people didn't wear running shoes to, ch uh, to school. They wore more dressier kind of shoes. And all the little girls had these black, shiny shoes that I called party shoes or dress shoes. And I needed new shoes. And we went to the shoe store. And my mother didn't think that these party shoes were good for my feet, that they were good and healthy. So she wanted me to have sensible shoes that were good for my feet. And so those are the shoes I got. And I was different from everybody else. And happily, nobody made fun of me at least that I heard, but I didn't like being different. And then there was a time I was 17 and I was in college and I had to take an anthropology course. And the very first class, uh, my friend and I, we were both Christians and we came into the room and we weren't late, but it was already crowded and we couldn't sit together. And so we sat very far apart in this huge room. And the professor, the teacher started off with saying, is there anyone here in this room who by any chance believes in creation and not evolution? And so very timidly, I raised my hand because I was the only one except for my friend who was very far away and she raised her hand. And we were different in that case. And the teacher said, well, I hope by the end of this course to convince you that um, that man made God in his own image. In other words, man made up God. Anyway, she didn't convince me. And I've had many situations since then. And sometimes when we follow God, we end up being different. Sometimes it's because we're following God that we won't do something. For example, um, so many thousands of years ago, the Babylon, the Babylonian king, the Bab Babylonians captured Israel and they took a whole lot of the people to Babylon. And among them, they took some very noble, well-to-do, rich um, young men, and they were going to train them to have positions in the king's court. So they were very, um, it was very good for them. It was a very good opportunity being cap captured and captives, but they were going to have this good opportunity. And they were even given food from the king's table. But this wasn't food that God wanted them to eat. God had his laws for his people, the things they shouldn't eat. And so Daniel and a few others, three others, refused to eat that food. They didn't want to. And God gave them favor and they were allowed not to. Interesting thing, there are many other people from the same group, people from Israel, that didn't seem to make that choice. But Daniel and his three fr friends chose to be different. They didn't try to be different. They were following God and that made them different because of what they wouldn't do. But sometimes following God means that we'll be different because what we will do. So another on another occasion, um, people who wanted to get rid of Daniel tricked the king into making a law that no one could pray to anyone else but him for a certain amount of time. But Daniel prayed three times a day as usual to the one true God, and he got into trouble. And it's a very intriguing story how God saved him but sometimes it's because um, we will do. He chose to still do the godly thing, to still pray to God. And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe, maybe for you it's being a friend to someone who is uncool that other people are making fun of. Doing a, that would be doing a godly thing. Or not doing something, um, as in the case of not eating that food, maybe that looks like not being rude to your parents even though other kids are or not gossiping even though those you are with are gossiping or not watching something inappropriate even though other people are matthew 7 12 verse uh, matthew 7 13 and 14 says enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter it are but are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. And I picture like there's this wide, wide path, just 
maybe wide like a highway and lots of people are walking along and, and that path is smooth because so many people have trampled it down and people are just going along with the crowd but that way ends in a cliff so when they all of a sudden boom they fall to their destruction and then there's this other path and it's narrow and it's not as smooth because not as many people have walked in and trampled it down and maybe sometimes it's steep and a little bit harder to go on but it leads to a castle where the people who are walking in that path get to live with God in this amazing castle. The narrow path, God's path, is the better path. And you can walk in that path and I can walk in that path. God's path, that's leading us to live forever with him. And it means we'll be different sometimes from people on the wide path. And that's okay. In fact, that's good. There's a song, a children's song, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. And we can do that because it's God's way. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that we have so many outstanding examples in your word of people who have um, walked the narrow path and chosen to enter by the narrow gate. And I thank you that by your Holy Spirit, we can dare to be different when you call us to. So Lord, I pray for all the children and the adults that you help us all to dare to be different as we seek to follow you. Amen. Well, thank you, Robin, for doing that. I'm going to change this here. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Thank you, Robin, for that, for those important and really good reminders uh, that, that you shared. And now uh, Vimala is going to come and she is going to read the scripture for us. Vimla, if you can turn your, let's see, did I do something wrong? I'm not sure. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. Give me a second here. There we go. Okay, Vimla, if you can turn your video on. And there we go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll bring it up. And there's the scripture should be there in a second. And I guess I'm yeah. there we go. You can begin, Vimala, when you're yeah. ready. Okay. Today's scripture is taken from St. Paul's first letter to Corinthians. He's talking about the people who uh, were all different, but we're all one in God, and we need to love each other with love. That's the love chapter. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning the verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not 
make it any less part of a body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would be the body be? As it is, there are many parts at one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first, ap first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Here is the lesson. Thank you, Vimala, for that. All right. Okay. 
We're continuing a, a series. I really wasn't originally planning a series, uh, but when I finished up the last series looking at the various Bible characters and how they are just like us so that we could be just like them, and then over uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday looked at how uh, Jesus became just like us so that we could become just like him, I've, I've parked on the just like him uh, as we discover hopefully discover more and more how much that is true and how that's supposed to be working in our lives in very, very powerful ways. And so we've been looking at Colossians chapter 3 with this in mind, and we're going to continue with a particular verse in Colossians 3, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, but obviously it chose uh, to have a different passage read for our scripture reading, uh, which Vimala just read for us, and uh, you, as many of you know, 1 Corinthians 13 has been called the love chapter. It's often read at weddings, and I think that's fine. I think there's so much in there that applies to, to marriage, but that's not its original context. And so I wanted to show that this beautiful section on love in the New Testament actually is in the context of Paul writing to a congregation that... I guess the best theological word of the condition that they were in is they were a real mess. There was competition and pride uh, that was that was working in them, and they were wonderfully gifted with uh, with capabilities from the Holy Spirit, capabilities that God desires to see expressed through all of our lives, and that they had, that they had in abundance, but they were not demonstrating God's power in their in their particular community in God's way. So they had God's power, but they weren't expressing it in God's way. And that's why it's so important to understand the love chapter in the middle, and actually there's a whole section, begins earlier and goes on to chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians. And as I say in many, many contexts, uh, my teaching context, we should be reading the Word of God in context, not just pulling passages uh, out in, in isolation. And so, the first Corinthians context really illustrates well for us the need for the whole group of believers, the body of believers, to relate to one another, not just, often we think, when we think of love, we think of being nice, you know, a Canadian kind of nice, where we actually, well, don't get involved in each other's lives in the way that God wants us to. So what happens is once we really start to get involved with one another and we speak into one another's lives, we speak up in our in our communities, then that could easily lead to all sorts of trouble. But that part's okay. Once we allow God to work in and through our lives in the way God wants us to, then it does start, there is agitation, there is, there's challenges, there's a, a dealing with different people's opinions uh, and, and this sort of thing. And what was wrong with the Corinthians isn't that they weren't speaking up, it's that it was how they were dealing with what was coming out of their mouths and, and lives. So what a lot of people end up doing is to avoid the trouble that the Corinthians were in, is we choose not to be involved, not to speak up, and that's not the answer. And so what I have to share this morning, God willing, I'm hoping, is going to help us uh, allow God to work through us in the way that He really wants to. And so we're going to be looking at a particular dynamic that has come about because of what Jesus has done for us by dying for our sins and rising for the dead. He has actually initiated a radical dynamic in our lives as communities that was unheard of in the first century and is still problematic in our own day. And as I said, I will explain as we go along. First of all, we need to get our context again. So I want to read uh, Colossians 3 verses 1 through 10 to remind us of what God has done in our lives because of Jesus. Paul writes, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And so what we see here is that because Jesus has risen from the dead, and if we've put our trust in him, some things have happened to us. We have become uh, participants in his resurrection in a very real way. And as a result of that newness of life, which is ours because of Jesus, then we still have to put off those, those things from the old life that still are a part of us, and then purposely put on the, the things that are part of the, of the new life, which is listed later on uh, in, in Colossians chapter 3. And we looked at a little bit of that the, uh, last time. And if you didn't see that sermon or listen to it, please do so. I encourage you to do that. Uh, there's, you know, there are people that don't realize what has been deposited in us if we truly are believers. And I cannot emphasize that enough, and I will not get tired of sharing that. If there is, if you are not sure that you are a child of God, please contact me, call me, email me, and I'll step you through what you need to do to become a true child of God. Just coming to a service, whether it's virtually or, or on, on Sundays, being part of the church your whole life, that does not make you a child of God. It's by putting your trust in Him. And we see that it's, there's putting our trust in Him is not just thinking something right about Him. It's about actually giving our lives to Him. And so, of course, if we've given our lives to Him, then we're going to get rid of the, the darkness that still dwells with us. And we're going to, uh, as much as possible, invite the light to do its work in our lives. There's a part for us to play. Faith is not passive. Faith is active. It's, and, and that activity, it's not what makes us a child of God. It's, our, it's because of what Jesus has done and our trust in Him. But then we need to re respond to His Word or else we may not be what we think we are. And so Paul here, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul here is talking about the newness of life which is ours. And this culminates in verse 10 with this thing that he says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And the part that's so difficult to understand is that there's, that God has done something miraculous, and we participate in that. But it's God who has done something. What he's done, there's, he is bringing about a renewal a renewal that's based on restoring His image in us. That which He w desired in the Garden of Eden, that our first parents turned their back on, and we've been suffering from that ever since, and has marred the image, uh, uh, His image in our lives, that is being restored because of what Jesus has done through His death and His resurrection and our putting our faith in Him. God is doing a huge renovation project in our lives. And the, the blueprints of that renovation is the very image of God. Now, there's something about what He's doing that is radical, and it's verse 11. Here... There is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, when we hear statements uh, like this, and there's a few of them in the New Testament about how it makes no difference who you are or what your background is, um, that it's, it's, it's for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. Salvation is for everyone. We are so used to that that we don't really stop and think, one, about the radical nature of what Paul is saying in his day and how still radical that is for us today. The reason, the reason that, 
let, let me say it, let me say it differently here. Paul is calling for a honesty within a congregation that is diverse. He's speaking about Jew and Gentile, barbarian, Scythian, and so on, slave and free, most likely because these people groups, people from those backgrounds, were part of the community in this city of Colossae. And he's calling them to relate to one another in a certain way. Don't lie to one another. He's calling for personal honesty with the various members of this congregation within a culture that is basically built on divisions where people are so used to seeing their own group that they're part of as the us and everybody else as the thems. And that was very, very strong in that culture. And yet the transformative work of God is at work equally, equally in all of these diverse groups. There's a tendency to think of our group as a superior group, our understanding of how life is to be lived, our understanding of culture. Yes, we often we prefer the the our cultural backgrounds. And we tend to look at people from other groups as, as inferior. Now it's not, may I say, not cool today in our society to, to actually verbalize that. And now in public, if you, if you would talk that way in any way, you can get in trouble. Interesting, we've had hundreds of, well, we've had 2,000 years of this teaching, but we haven't done a really good job and I know we've got laws, you know, anti-racial laws that, that are in, in, in the Western, especially in the Western world. But how about our hearts and how we look at other people? You know, in this particular list, we've got Greek and Jew. So this is culturally two very different groups that did not look kindly at each other circumcised and uncircumcised you might think that's a repetition but he, he might re be referring to the religious components between jews and gentiles and then the barbarians they were the the uncultured people from other parts of 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 the empire that didn't didn't um didn't embrace greek culture and the scythians they were seen as even worse especially by the greeks they were uh, they weren't savages. They were, but they were savage in their military ways, and they were they were conquerors, and and they would not look at kindly. And of course, they themselves would not look at these other people groups in a kind sort of way. Then we have the slave and the free, and these are these are very, you know, more than economic, but it, it's that sort of thing where these two groups were very divided, and you know, the the free people will look down on the slaves, but the people forced to work for no pay by their masters, they would not look very kindly. They may not say anything to them because of the kind of trouble they would get into, but could you imagine how the slaves talk to each other about the free people and about their masters? Today, think about how people talk about their employers, how people talk about their customers. There's such an us and them. And and we do tend to look at other peoples and other cultures in a, in a negative sort of way. Or we could look at other cultures and, and see them as so superior that we feel belittled in our own eyes as we relate to people of, of other cultures. I don't know what each one of you in our fellowship thinks about the various uh, people groups that are, are represented in our fellowship. Now you might be thinking, why would even we talk, don't even talk about different people groups in our fellowship because we're all one, right? We're all one in Jesus. And because we're all one in Jesus, these things don't matter anymore. And if we had time, and if you're interested, I could send you a list of different English translations and how they deal with this passage. To, and, and some translations give the impression that these, these different groups, the diversity of groups in the, in the Colossian community, that because of Jesus, these divisions, they don't matter anymore. They just don't matter anymore. 
But that's not what Paul's saying. Our, our, our backgrounds matter. Our backgrounds make us what we are. We, we approach life in particular ways. We approach food and, and, and entertainment and, you know, music and, and different things. And, you know, just because, um, you know, you, I, I, how do I say this? Each one of us have different music of the heart. And maybe it's very difficult. There's, so, I, you know, I choose a few songs every week. There's no way I'm going to please everyone. There's whether it's, uh, and, and, and what happens is, here's the, here's the problem. We all tend to think of the things that we love, especially in a Christian context, we tend to think of them, that's the, the Christian version of whatever it is that we think of as Christian. But as you know, if, if, if some of you would be willing to share people from, who have come from other countries, other, other cultures, um, you know, what, what's really Christian to you? What's Christian to you and, uh, and a, Christ, a, Christian, a true Christian approach to worship, a true Christian approach to prayer, a true Christian approach to community might be very different than how other people feel those things are. And so when we start to think that the different, um, the diversity that we have of our cultures, of our people groups, we start to think of them as they don't matter what happens is we begin to adopt particular cultural practices that we think that's the, the Christian version, or maybe for our fellow, the Lutheran version, or the All Saints version. But we have, a, we have a problem. If we start looking at what the Scripture says, the Scripture is telling us, and we saw that very powerfully in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is we all have diversity of gifts. And there's an expectation that we're going to share with one another what God gives to us. And it's, you know, if this was simply about our foods, and I know we've done this and I've, I've loved it when we've had like international foods. The funny thing is, you know, Canadian, Canadian food's international too. Whatever Canadian food is, and I don't really, I don't, what's Canadian food? You know Tim Hortons coffee. Um, it's not poutine because it's not c Canada wide Canadian food. Um, I went actually went to, uh, when I was in Atlanta some years ago. Um, the person who was hosting me, I was going to a conference there, and uh, picked me up um, from the airport and offered to take me to a restaurant for lunch. And he said, "What do you want? Do you want to go for Chinese? Do you want to go for Indian? Do you want to go for Canadian?" And he's a Canadian what's canadian they actually had a canadian restaurant it was called this is this is true it's it um but it was bugaboo lodge i think i'm saying it right bugaboo lodge and and, and the red we went there and the restaurant it, it had uh, animatronic moose and 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 buffalo and there was mounties and um what i ended up having it was some sort of southern dish there they, they didn't even have poutine uh uh there um there wasn't any canadian food it was just a canadian hunting lodge motif restaurant anyway it only goes to show too when we start to think about other people groups other cultures we have our own images of what what that's like and i actually took the, you know they're so friendly in the south you've been down there talk about a culture and the manager comes out and he talks to me like i'm his old friend and um i actually suggested to him maybe they should have at least have something like putin uh because it's that's a little more uh more specifically canadian than whatever uh barbecue thing that i was i was eating there uh at the time but anyway it's it's difficult for us to 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 truly welcome other cultures and relate to those cultures in the way that 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 they would they would actually appreciate um so the, the passage continues i'm going to read it at chapter 3 verses 12 to 17 put on then as god's chosen ones holy and beloved compassionate hearts kindness humility meekness and patience bearing with one another and if one has a complaint against one another against another forgiving each other as the lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive now if you think of this not just as people in a fellowship think of this as a, div a diverse group of people that see life differently even while embracing a Christian approach, a biblical approach to life, there's because of the different cultures and divisions, they're going to f deal with life differently. And so the, the opportunity for issues, for problems, for conflicts is greater. So bearing with one another, if one has a complaint against 
another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you, you mu also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You know, harmony demands diversity. Harmony is not unison. But a lot of people think that Christian unity should be unison, where we're all doing the same, and, and we appreciate all the same things. But what would happen if we actually allowed our diversity to flourish in our midst? Well, at the beginning, we're going to clash. But if we practice love and patience in the way Paul says, then we'll finally be able to have harmony as the differences among us become expressed. Verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And we, you know, peace is not simply calmness. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is everything in its right place. It's actually health. It's health when your body is all functioning the way that it should. That's the, the biblical concept of peace. The only way to have peace in our fellowship is allowing people to express themselves and learning to do so in a way that's going to be constructive. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Thankful even when not everything is exactly the way we prefer. Maybe give room for how some uh, ways that other people prefer. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, get, thankfulness in your hearts to God. People contributing to the life of the community, but contributing what they have to bring, not what they expect other people want them to bring, but what do you, you know, it's like the little drummer boy, Carol, like all he had was the drum. And so he brought his drum to, uh, to, the, to the baby Jesus. What's your drum? Do you have something hidden away in your closet that's precious to you, that you want to share uh, in the midst of the congregation that other people will be enriched by? If only they would go, well, it's a drum. We don't do drums. I don't mean to make fun. That's Drums is one of the things that's caused great conflict in, in churches for all sorts of reasons. We need to learn, and, and perhaps there are cultural things that we have that's part of our lives that we need to learn that are not godly. And some, one of the ways we, we learn to address what's wrong with our lives is by interacting with people that are able to see it, but they need to do so in love, not with condemnation and put-downs. So let the word of Christ dwell in you, richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart, in hearts to God. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So often what happens when we start to give permission to people to truly express themselves, then we get a lot of, you know, them, themselves. And what we do need to do is, is to conduct ourselves in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord, to do things as unto the Lord. But we need to bring our hearts, our souls, our strengths, our imaginations, our creativity, our cultures in, into the midst of our fellowship. So we actually need to hear from one another. You know, our church is, is seeking to enter into another phase of, of, uh, of again, uh, what, what's our vision? What's our vision of the church? How are we going to move forward? And if, if those of you who are watching this are going to be part of that, then we need to hear from you. We need to hear from you. Maybe you think your opinion What's on your heart is, is not going to be thought of, of highly. But I, I, I want to encourage people to begin to share. To begin to share. Maybe following these services over Zoom and in our fellowship, we'll find a way that people could share more in, 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 in the way that's described in 1 Corinthians, giving people an opportunity to speak God's word to one another. We need that. We need to hear from you. We need to hear what the gifts from the gifts that God has given you. But one of the ways we can start from is, like, we're, we're struggling as a church. I think that is obvious. Do you ha maybe have some insights that you would like to share that might make it a difference? And maybe what you're going to bring is, is half the solution or a sixteenth of, of the solution. Maybe some of what you and I are thinking is a little off, and that's why we need to help each other. But we're not going to find out unless we actually have the courage to share. And so I want to encourage you to not just talk among yourselves uh, um, and, you know, if only the church would do this and only the church would do that, that's not going to, that's not going to help. But um, whether there's someone on council that you trust, but I, I, 
what I really would like you to do, um, it will help me, and, and, and I have a pledge uh, for you. Whatever is on your heart, whatever you are thinking, you, you're, what you share with me will be respected, and I will treat you with respect. I want to encourage people to phone me or to write to me and tell me what you think. What, what do you think God is saying to All Saints Lutheran Church at this time? And maybe I'm going to have difficulty understanding it. Maybe your English isn't great, and the way that you write is going to be difficult for me to understand. So I'll write you back and say, well, what do you mean by this? And then you could respond. And maybe we'll have a telephone call or a, or a Zoom meeting together, face by face to face, and we could talk about what's on your heart. What do you think God is saying to our church, to Ottawa, to Canada, to the world? What do you think would help our church? Share that. We need to hear from you. We need to hear from all of you. And so please, I encourage you, phone me or or write to me uh you may have seen there's various reasons why i dif have difficulty reaching out to people and there's not enough time to get into it right now um but when when people write me and people call me i i'm so glad to spend that time as needed to what to deal with whatever is on your heart questions that you might have concerns that you might have insights that you might have suggestions that you might have i want to hear from you so please email me call me and we can discuss some of these things and see how our precious fellowship can go forward. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you that you have made us part of your family. And would you please show us how to conduct ourselves as members of your family? And in this little, this little expression of your worldwide family, All Saints Lutheran Church, we ask, that you would stir up in our hearts what your Spirit is saying to each one of us and help us to hear from one another with love and respect. Help us to share with love and respect. Help us to hear with love and respect. Forgive us, Lord, for looking down on others because they're different. Forgive us, Lord, for looking down upon ourselves because we're different. And help us, Father, to take our place in this community, according to your will, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.